Father, we thank you for this morning that we can gather even virtually in this way uh, because there is no limit to your presence. There's no barrier to your presence. And so as we have worshiped and we have exalted the name of Jesus this morning, uh, we're believing that the Holy Spirit is giving us the strength that we need, even, even today, even this moment, the strength that we need and the hope for tomorrow. Lord, right now I want to lift up all of, all of the uh, medical professionals, all of the scientists, everybody that's out there uh, fighting the battle against this disease, Lord. I want to, as we have gathered and we are all agreeing across uh, living rooms and across the screens that, that, that connect us right now, we, we gather our hearts and our voices collectively and we say, Lord, come and be present in these hospitals and these labs and all of the places uh, that are the front lines. And Lord, come and empower this work. Come and give us victory, Lord. And Lord, by now we might know someone that is actually uh, infected by COVID-19. And Lord, we ask that you in a very powerful way would move in their bodies and their lives. Lord, give us victory. You are our hope. You are the one that we turn to in these moments. We have no one else but you. You are our hope. You are the help that we need. And Lord, for us that, that are getting the opportunity to worship, Lord, we are in need of you. We're in need of hope. We are in need of being reminded that you are with us, that you are in control. We're in need of so many things. And we know that you provide. We know that you are big enough to provide. So, Lord, I ask as we open the scriptures this morning together with the purpose of it being the means by which we hear your voice. I ask on behalf of my brothers and sisters watching, um, on my behalf, on all of our behalves, Lord, come and take these ordinary words and these ordinary thoughts and make them be something meaningful for all of us that we would be absolutely convinced that you are here in this room with us, that you have never left our side, that you are our guide, and you are the God, the God that we have trusted, and you will not lose this battle. We, pre we pray this today together in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I am Pastor Silverio. In case we haven't had the chance to meet, and if this is the first time that we're meeting this way, uh, I look forward to the opportunity to get in to meet you in person. Um, this is actually week three, uh, I think. I have lost count of how many weeks. I mean, sometimes I need to be reminded what day it actually is. I, I don't know if that's happened to you. Uh, but as I'm, I am saying this, as I'm ge uh, getting a chance to, to talk to you uh, through, through this means, uh, coming to you perhaps in your living room or you are on, you know, somewhere in your home or maybe outside. You figured out by now how to take the TV out to the patio if it's a nice day, right? Um, I want to encourage you, would you just leave us a comment wherever you're watching on YouTube or Facebook uh, you know, we don't have the, the luxury right now, or I don't have the luxury right now of looking out and seeing all of the wonderful faces, uh, the smiles and the nods and, and all of that stuff that make gathering to worship so awesome and, uh, and just powerful and, and that we are a gathered body, that we do come together in Jesus' name. And so right now all we have are comments and we have uh, emojis and, and likes and hearts and all that kind of stuff. And so I want to encourage you throughout, if you haven't already, just, just drop a comment where you're watching from, who's watching with you. Um, it just encourages us. Uh, it just lets us know in this, in this time of, of virtual worship that, that we are connected. 
Um, and some of you even drop pictures. I saw an awesome picture last week of, of worship, and, and the dog is there listening to me talk. I mean, that is awesome. I have never, ever in my wildest dreams imagined being able to preach to, to pets, but, but this is the time. There's not, <laughs> if this is the time for that, right? And so I, I, we love the pictures. We love all of that, and, it, and it's a way that we can do uh, everything we can to remind us that we are indeed connected, even in a time like this. Um, and so this week, uh, I, I heard a lot of stuff, uh, obviously important stuff that we're keeping track of and, and how to stay safe and all of that good stuff and how to be praying for the people that are in the front lines and what are our needs and that kind of thing. And so I hope you've been praying too and I, I've been praying. And, uh, but in the midst of all that, I, I've heard funny stuff. Um, you know, like uh, humor is an important thing to, to grab onto in a time like this. It, it helps us. It helps us to deal with this. It helps us to deal with the uncertainty. Like uh, just today, I heard uh, already somebody has come up with a list of top 10 pickup lines for the time of quarantine. I mean, like look that up. I mean, it's one of those things, right? You don't want to laugh. It's just like, this is too cheesy. And there's no way, there's no way I'm going to laugh. But you get to number 10 and you can't help it. It's just, it's just ridiculous and, and, and you have a good laugh. And so there's all kinds of things that, that we can look and see and hear that makes us laugh. And there's also plenty of things that have made, just been good for the souls to hear. Like just uh, all kinds of folks going on their live Facebook page or in the Instagrams, sharing, sharing a word of hope, sharing a song. Um, so all kinds of good things. And I hope that's been your experience to balance out all of this worry with, with things that bring light, the things that bring hope to our hearts and to our ears. And I want to share uh, the, perhaps the most impactful thing that I, that I saw and read this week. Uh, my wife has shared, my wife Lindsay has shared something on her page, and, and one of her former pastors, uh, actually a uh, pastor that had uh, mentored us while we were engaged, uh, commented about something she read that really caught my attention. Um, they, they happened to be out, and they saw a sign posted on a door uh, at a nursery, a nursery for, for trees and for plants and that kind of thing. And the sign said this, closed but still growing. Closed but still growing. And, and she went on to reflect how that gave them a, 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 just an opportunity for them to meditate on, on how God works in these times of difficulties and how, much, how many times in their own lives they, they've, they've realized that even in times when the door has been closed for an opportunity, um, God has still been at work. Um, and even in scripture, uh, we, we see over and over and again these examples of, of, of things not going as planned or are, are heroes of faith facing times of difficulty and uncertainty in the scriptures, and God still being at, growth, at, at work. And, and there's a sense of growth. There's a sense that God is doing something even when I don't think nothing, or I think nothing is happening. And so that gave me something to reflect on this, this, this week, and I, I want to invite you to reflect on that with me. And, and I sort of want to take this just to lift the plane up a little bit and just kind of get a big picture of what we talk about, maybe something to think about when we talk about growth. Uh, growth we can talk about all kinds of growth, specific kinds of growth in our own lives and in our community, but if we look at scripture, uh, maybe we can summarize the entire, the entire theme of scripture, an entire invitation that God makes, makes to us, to you and to me, throughout scripture, as us growing in our knowledge and our awareness of who God is and our relationship to God and our place in creation and God's creation and this entire thing that God has created us for um, and what that is and what that looks like and what that means for everything that we do, say, and think, and how we act, everything that we exist for. So I'm going to give you a, uh, just to unpack that a little bit, you know. Uh, this, God created the skies. God created the, the, the seas. And each of these pieces of creation knows where it begins and where it ends. The sea knows where it's going to start and where it ends. 
um, the stars and the skies, everything, everything, including us. So God has created you and I with all of these abilities, all of, these, all of this knowledge, the, the capacity for so much growth. But, it, but if one thing remains through it, this entire process of growth, is that we get to a point where we, we get to our limit, and, and that limit, God is above that limit. In other words, God has created us with all this potential, with all this ability, but at the end of the day, we aren't God. At the end of the day, God is God and we are not. So that's just, I think, the point in which we get to grow in our awareness and how that becomes something that, that is lived out through our lives in any season. But close, but still growing. In other, in other words, what growth is there for us in the, this particular season? And what I've reflected on is that in times of difficulty, in times of closed doors, um, God doesn't change his will for our lives. I've said that. I said that last week. God doesn't change the, the trajectory of what he's calling us towards. It continues, whether we are in the valley or in the mountain, whether the door is open or closed. But it seems like in these seasons in which the door closes, whether it was ordained by God or it's just, it's just a matter of fact. Uh, like, you know, you apply for a job and you didn't get it. Uh, maybe God closed the door intentionally, but maybe um, there was one position in 100 applicants, and so 99 of those people saw a door closed. Regardless, God's will and God's plan for us to grow in our knowledge of who God is and how we live our lives in relation to who God is continues. But if something I might say about a season of difficulty, that they, it seems like, these seasons bring to the forefront of our awareness this choice that we get to make for ourselves. Is God really God for me? Is God really God for me? In other words, whether this is a season of, of triumph or great uncertainty and, and, and difficulty, like the one that we're living like worldwide right now, is this truth about God something in which I am going to trust and continue to grow into? That whatever may happen, whatever comes my way, whatever comes your way, we are committed to living our lives, trusting that God is still God, God is still in control, and if I believe all of that, that means something for how I live my life day to day, in this season, and in a season to come. So I want to invite you to, to meditate on that. And, and, I, and I thought about, you know, how many times in Scripture uh, this plays out just like that. I mean, all the way from Abraham, God promising Abraham a son, and he is old, you know, doesn't have a son, and he is waiting for that. And what happens in Abraham's life throughout that waiting? I think about Anna. The, the mother of the great prophet Samuel, she could not bear children. And so she would show up at the temple over and over again, pleading for God to give her a child. And this, this was so extraordinary that, that the priest actually thought she was drunk. She, he wanted to send her home and you, you need to, you know, go, get, go sober up and then come back. And, and she was actually in great agony because the waiting was hard. And yet that time of waiting and that time of difficulty, God is still working in her life. I think about David, the great king who was anointed to be king, but it was not yet his time to be king. There was another king named Saul, and that dynamic was difficult for him. Saul became very jealous of David, and, and that made life very difficult for David. But that season that, that was difficult, that, was, that seemed like that was just overwhelmingly overwhelming and, 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 and just unnecessary even. Well, why didn't God just, just take Saul away if he already knew David was his king? 
And we can see the effects of what that produced in David and to make him one of the great kings, uh, uh, one of the heroes of the faith in, in Scripture. The prophet Elijah, who, who did a, a just miraculous things, a God worked mightily through him in a very difficult season of, of the life of the people of Israel. And we talked about that, uh, I think a few weeks ago, we shared a story. Um, the Queen Jezebel wanted to kill Elijah, and he's running from her half the time. That season of difficulty and what that produced in his life, God is still working. God is still working in Elijah. God is still working in you. God is still working in me. God is still working in those folks in the front lines facing this situation with their backs against the wall. God is still working. And God is at work, and God was at work in the man by the name of Habakkuk. And that's where I want to take us this morning um, Habakkuk was a prophet, and we find his work, his oracle, in the scriptures towards the end of the Old Testament, way, way in the back, and he is known, and I'm going to go into a little bit of a Bible study mode here, just to give you some background. He is known as one of the minor prophets, um, and this is simply because his book is, is one of the shortest there is in, in all of scripture, it's just four chapters. Uh, but it's included in there, and, and one thing that we know that is helpful to know as we read Habakkuk is that he did or wrote this or spoke these words about 600 or a little over 600 years before Christ. Uh, and I tell you this so that we can kind of put this in, in the sort of the historical map and, and, we, and the make, let the words make a little more sense to us. Um, this is akin, as one of my great professors, Samuel Richter, would always say, uh, it, it's akin to, to hearing the words of Martin Luther King Jr. say, I have a dream. And, and knowing, because we've studied the history of America and we know uh, of the great sin of our nation and what that period was like before the, the civil rights movement and what it continues to be like now and some of the things that we still live through and even in this day that, that we need God's help and grace to, to be better at. But knowing all of that and experiencing all of that give meaning to MLK's words. And it would be very different if we didn't know this history and we didn't know the background and we would hear them and we would hear the words of, I have a dream, and it would be like, oh, well, that's a nice point, right? And, and that's a very odd thing he says about the state of Mississippi, right? We would have no way, no context for the power that these words carry. And so I want to give you the context for Habakkuk. He, he actually is speaking to the same people, the same era that Jeremiah is speaking to. Uh, the, it, the kingdom of Israel has already fallen. They've already been destroyed and taken captive by the Assyrians. By this time in history, uh, the Assyrians have fallen. They're a new great empire, the Babylonian, the Neo-Babylonian empire is, is, is storming the, the earth, conquering everything in, in their way at this time. And, and we can go to Jeremiah the prophet Jeremiah, to read and, and get a bigger sense of what's going on and what people are feeling, especially what the people of God are feeling in this time. And that is the world that Habakkuk speaks to. And so it's not, a, it's not an easy world. It's a very uncertain world. It's one in which he, he looks out and he's already seen what has happened in the northern Israel, uh, is, kingdom of Israel. He is a part of the kingdom of Judah. This is after the split of the two nations. And he's worried. And he sees his people. Uh, and he's worried. And he goes to God. And so in this book, this very short book, we, it's four chapters long. It's, you, we can basically organize it in five different sections. Habakkuk goes to God with the complaint. God answers his complaint. Habakkuk then shall we say, follows up his original complaint, the little more complaint, given God's answer. 
And then God responds to the follow-up that, God, that Habakkuk gives him. And at the very end, Habakkuk resolves this entire issue. He, he brings this thing to closure. He takes God's response and does something with it. And so we're going to take the next two weeks to be in this very short book because I think, I think this book speaks of hope even in the midst of uncertainty. And how we grow, and how we grow, and, or if we are to grow when the door is closed, friends, we need hope. That is the secret ingredient. And so um, this morning I want to open our scriptures. You have your Bible. Uh, I'm not going to read the entire book, but I am going to highlight um, a, few, a few different verses to kind of give us a thing to meditate, something to meditate on this morning that would bring hope to our hearts. And now that we have the context. So open your Bible in Habakkuk, chapter 1. You'll, you'll see it in your screen as well. And this is sort of the beginning of Habakkuk's complaint. This is verse 2. He says this. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry. But you do not come to save. So what is Habakkuk's complaint? He is looking at his people and he sees violence. And later on, he, he, he describes evil deeds. This is what's happening around him. And he's very disturbed by him. But the observation that I want to make with these words or something that you and I could identify with is this. How long, oh Lord, must I cry out for help and you do not listen? Friends, I, I think you would agree with me that the feeling that God is not hearing our prayers, it's a real experience. Have you ever been there? I mean, I know I've been there. And I think the entire world probably has been there, especially right now as we look at this, uh, this, this crisis, this health crisis around the world. And, and, and this is unique, right? Uh, in previous days, we, we have seen a crisis break out in one part of the world, and so we join with that part of the world and say, God, bring, bring healing and bring, you know, fix this. Save us from this. Uh, but, and so, and then, the, then it's the turn for the other part of the world to be in crisis. And so that part of the world is praying for them, right? And in this case, we're all crying out to God, come and give us relief from this pandemic. And being it, this is already, at least here, the second week in which we've been shut at home and really not seen the light at the end of the tunnel yet. How many of us would say, like Habakkuk this morning, how long, Lord, do we need to pray for this? How long are, are we going to be in this? And it doesn't seem like you're responding. And so I find in these words just this sense of sort of affirmation, if you will. This is the real feeling. But the other thing that I see here, and it's the thing that I want to encourage you with, that as I read Habakkuk saying these very words, it, it comes to my mind that this means that Habakkuk is keep, keeps on coming back to God. In other words, he is persisting. He is persisting and coming back to God because he knows ultimately where the help is going to come from. So while this feeling of God not moving in our midst or God not giving us the, the answer that we need, God not resolving this thing that we are facing is real. It is also real that we have the ability and the choice to make, to trust that ultimately our help comes from God. And so I'm going to keep coming back. Persist. Keep knocking on the door. As Jesus invites us in the Gospels. And the door will be open. But then God, 
as we move into the second part of, of Habakkuk, God does respond. And so in verse 5, we have these words. The Lord replied, Look around at the nations. Look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. So I want to stop right here. So if the feeling of God not answering our prayer or God not moving in our midst the way we need him to is real, and nothing can diminish that. I mean, that is, if that's how you feel, that is a real feeling, and I want to affirm that. But I, I think what I find in this verse is, is the reality. That even while we feel that God is not moving or God is not working, it just in the same way that God replies or responds to Habakkuk, hey, I'm actually doing something right here. The reality is that God is indeed working. And so, friends, what I want to tell you is that silence does not mean that God isn't present. The silence that we feel does not mean that God is not aware of what is going on. The silence that we experience in our prayer life, for whatever it may be, it, it, right now is this crisis, but we also may be facing other crises in our lives. Personal crisis. Ongoing crisis that maybe span weeks and months or maybe even years. The reality or the response to our real feeling, the reality is that God is indeed aware and God is indeed present. So we need to cling on to that. Let's pick up on verse 6. God says, I am raising up the Babylonians. Your, your version might say Chaldeans. They're all part of the same army, the Neo-Babylonian army that was taking over the world at that time. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. So let me go a little bit back into Bible study mode here. What is God doing here? God is actually addressing the very thing that Habakkuk is noticing. So Habakkuk is noticing evil. He is uh, noticing violence. He's noticing all the things uh, that people shouldn't be doing. And, you know, he, he, we can assume because he's a prophet. I mean, he is a righteous man. He is living a, a, a life that is honorable before God. And so he has the feeling, like many of us probably have the feeling, when we have coworkers that don't do what they're supposed to do, and here we are busting our butt to try to do the right thing. And yet we all get paid the same, right? And so that's not fair. And so Habakkuk has that same feeling. Like, I, I, am, I am being righteous. I'm a righteous man. But things are so bad that justice is not even served in our courts. So he's looking at that from a, a, a human symptom point of view, if you will. This is what it looks like on the ground. And yet God is looking at that same situation from the big picture and addressing it from the big picture. So what you need to know here is that way back in Exodus, when God gives the people of Israel the land that they possess, that they still possess in this point of time in history, he makes a covenant with them, a contract, if you will, and in that covenant, God says, I'm giving you this land. I mean, he says a lot of things, but let me just summarize it. I'm, I'm giving you this land. And, the thing, and there, are, there are requirements. There are stipulations of this contract in order for you to keep this land. And the main one is that you have to remain faithful to me, ask God. And so at the end of the contract, um, we have what they're called blessings, and we have cur curses. So the blessings are the things that happen if, if everybody abides by the contract. 
These are the benefits, if you will. Think about the benefits you have in memberships that you own. If you, you know, get so many stars at your favorite coffee shop, you get a free coffee or whatever it is just by doing the thing they want you to do, which is buy more coffee. And in this case, it, it is live in the land, be prosperous, uh, just, just be, uh, live in peace. All of these things, live in the blessing of the Lord. Similarly, we have, or alternately, we have also curses. These are the things that go into effect if the terms of the contract are not met. Namely, being the ability to continue or the right to continue living in the land that God gave them. So think about being a landlord. You rent out your, your home, you rent out your, your Airbnb or whatever it is that you have, and you have some terms that, that you're giving your renters. And as long as they abide by them, we're good. But the minute something breaks, somebody breaks off that covenant, then you get to boot them out. And so it is, this is the thing that God is doing. Uh, so, and it's important to know this because otherwise it's like, whoa, well, God, what are you doing? You're sending this army to destroy Israel or the people of Judah? No, this is the, the terms of the contract that the people agreed to. And the only thing they had to do was remain faithful to God. So this is what my observation is. As I look at what Habakkuk is asking for and what God is doing, it's this. Habakkuk is asking God to respond to the symptoms of these unfaithful people of God. And what are the symptoms? The symptoms are violence, their evil deeds, injustice in the courts. And, and Habakkuk is just wanting to just say, God, come and, and fix this so that there would be no more violence. Stop, stop the violent people so that there would be no more evil deeds. Stop the evil deeds so that there would be no more justice. Take care of them. Bring, bring just judgment upon them. God, however, has a bigger plan. Or a bigger purpose here. He is not looking just at the symptoms. He is looking at the entire condition and addressing that. He is looking at the state of the faithfulness of the people of Israel. Faithfulness to what? Well, I think this points back to what we said at the beginning, what are we being faithful to? We are called to grow and remain faithful to this growth that God is calling us to. And it's simply summarized like this, God is God and I am not. And because God is God and I am not, that means a whole lot of things for how I'm going to live. How, that means a whole lot of things for how I'm going to handle times, difficult times such as these. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that God is asking me to do is the only thing that God has asked the people of Israel to do is to remain faithful to God. Because God is remaining faithful to us. God is working in the entire scope of the trajectory of our lives, not just this one situation. So I want to say more about that next week. But I want you to remember that. God has before him this entire world, this entire circumstance, your entire life, your future included. Your family's future. All of that is in God's hands. And God is working. Well, let's go back to Habakkuk's. Follow up to God's response and I'm just going to read verses 12 and 13 here and this is what how how Habakkuk responds to God he says oh Lord my God my holy one you are eternal surely you do not plan to wipe us out oh Lord our rock you have sent these Babylonians to correct us to punish us for our many sins but you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil would you wink at their treasury? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up the people 
more righteous than they. So what Habakkuk is doing here is saying, wait, wait a minute, God. I, I know I asked you to correct this, but I, I didn't mean for you to wipe us all out. I mean, they're more evil than us. Uh, how could you even consider this as a possibility? This, you, you can't associate yourself with those guys, can you? You know what he's doing? He's wrestling with God. He's, he's taking what he heard and saying, wait a minute. And he's going back to God and saying, Let, help me make sense of this because this, 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 this can't be. So I've often heard this term wrestle with God and, and I, I, I try to think about how best to explain it or what, what it actually means to me. And, and to me, it simply means that we continue the dialogue with God even in the midst of of us not understanding or not comprehending or not even agreeing, perhaps, with God. And, and the point of wrestling with God is simply to stay connected with God by continuing the dialogue with God. And it is not lost on me that Habakkuk uh, in the Hebrew actually means he who embraces or a wrestler. I mean, that's what his name literally means. And this is what he's actually doing. Because, friends, we, we have two choices here. We either wrestle with God when we don't understand or when we don't agree or we simply, uh, we're, we're, we're left unsettled with God's involvement in all of this. We either continue the dialogue or we simply stop the dialogue altogether. And this is and this is what Habakkuk does. Verse 1 of, of chapter 2. He says, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says, and he will answer my complaints. Even in the midst of his own uncertainty, Habakkuk has resolved to not end the conversation. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. How do we find hope when well, the situation might look rather hopeless. Where or how do we allow God to fill us in our hearts, in our mind, in our entire being with hope for tomorrow? When we might not understand or might not agree or simply are like Habakkuk at the beginning, we have a sense that God is not at work. We, we don't hear him. We don't see him. We don't feel him. And I think we find it here is in this resolve to continue the dialogue, to wrestle, to embrace, to stay here, to go up and wait as, as Habakkuk does, to our watchtower, to wherever it is that we go and spend time with God, to our rooms, to that chair, to the garden, to wherever it is we go and we wait and we resolve to stay. Because the more that we continue this dialogue, we stay near to God. Even when our hearts and even when our minds are in a rough shape. And that, my friends, is what we need to do right now. Stay near to God. And when we stay near to God, God is continuing to to help us grow. God can continue to grow us, every aspect of us, not just the aspect that we need right now, every aspect of us. And friends, the hope, our hope, your hope and my hope, lies and this confidence, and this is what God is growing in me, and I, and I hope it's growing in you too, and I pray that it is, and the confidence that the answer will come. 
that God's answer will come. That we're not waiting in vain. That we're not praying in vain. And as we do this, and, and we'll, we'll get past this, and, and we will push through this, what, how, however it, it takes, with God's help. Friends, I believe this is a season that, that this, this is going to get ingrained in our hearts and going to ingrain in our, in our minds, and we're going to get to ingrain it in our children's hearts because we have lived through this. The answer of God will come. So I invite you right now, as we let that word just sort of sink into our hearts so that it will be there tomorrow when we need it. I invite you just to take a deep breath. In a moment, we're going we're gonna to sing the song that, that we said we're going to sing throughout the season, just this prayer of blessing, this reminder that God is for us, this word of truth that we need to be speaking over ourselves and over our families at all times, not just this season. But I want to invite you this moment right now as we, we take a moment to pray again. Place your trust in God. Place your entire trust in God right now. And maybe the way you start doing that is, is by speaking it out. Lord, I trust you. Or if you need to back that up a little bit, say, Lord, I want to trust you. Help me to trust you right now. I believe the Holy Spirit is big enough to help us in these moments. Let's pray together. Lord, you are big enough to be present even when we can't be present with each other. You're big enough to be present in this room and all of the rooms of all of us watching. You're big enough to pre be present in the season in which it's, it's really hard to see if you're present or not. But you're bigger. Lord, I, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this moment that you would give us the grace to surrender whatever it is we need to surrender to you and, and just plant ourselves on this truth that you are still God. Then if you're still God, you're still in control. And if you're still in control, you are for us. And you have all of us. Whatever happens. However, this thing shakes out in the end, you still have us in your hands. And so, Father, right now, I pray for rest. I pray for peace. I pray right now for all of us who are restless, having been stuck in the confines of our house for several days now. Come bring rest. Lord, and as you do, may we be, you, me, myself, and all of us that are praying right now, may you use us in whatever ways you can and whatever we have to offer, may you use us to speak words of truth, to speak words of peace to the world, to be in whatever shape, and in whatever ways we can even physically be present. Um, that's quite limited right now, but in the, in the right time, I believe you're going to use all of us to go out, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this city. And you're going to break barriers that right now stand because of this, and your gospel is going to reach places that it had not reached because of this. Lord, I just speak right now that you are making beauty out of ashes, that you are making good out of evil. And we stand on that truth right now. As we sing together this blessing, as we sing this over ourselves, over our family, over our church, over our city, over the world, you are the God of this blessing. 
And so we give you all praise right now. All honor and all glory is yours in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to sing this now with me.